Egyptian, Egyptian radio usually says the uh, hour is 12 o'clock, as we've just learned from the clock on the tower of the University of Cairo. So we can't hear the University of Ta Cairo ticking, but it's 12 o'clock, and here we are. We are resuming our conference. Please take your seats. Our conference bears the name of transition, which implies a movement from one place or one time to another. Professor Lewis has aptly termed his keynote, What Next?, indicating a perspective that looks into the future. As we move to the first of our six panels, six sessions on the different topics, we have to turn the time vectors backwards looking at the past, and only then, perhaps, can we try and speculate about the future. This first session is about sectarianism and politics, the cases of Iraq and Lebanon, quote, unquote. The relevant Arabic terms for sectarian would be taifia or iklimia, and a few others, but these are the main two, which, when used in a political context, carry a negative, a pejorative meaning. In the history of the Middle East, sectarianism was regarded as an antithetical to the mainstream of Arab nationalism prior to Second World War and, of course, afterwards. When Abdel Nasser's drive for Arab unity came to naught, and when the hopes of Ba'athism to spread their mission all around were disillusioned, sectarianism and regionalism, these are the two terms, gathered renewed relevance and certain respectability. However, in the modern and contemporary Middle East, these terms are seldom used in the context of the central state, Egypt, or in that of the richest one, Saudi Arabia, or in the, that of the very active player, Syria, and how about our neighbor on the east, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. But these terms have been used for many years and are even more relevant nowadays in the context of Iraq in Lebanon. In Iraq, they'll rather refer to it as taifia. In Lebanon, they'll prefer the other term, eklimia, but basically, these are the same terms, or they carry the same meaning. The larger part of our session is devoted to Iraq. Transition, which is the name of this conference, has been the most appropriate term to be applied in the context of Iraq for the last six years or so in more than one sense, of course. I am not sure that I would go along with Peter Slaglet's description in a book review he recently published of a book just appeared on Iraq, when he, Peter Slaglet, called Iraq, I'm quoting, a chaotic, semi-theocratic hell, unquote. Although certain elements used here may partially apply to its political reality. However, in the security sphere, statistically speaking, there has been a very distinct trend of steady, a steady drop of the casualties in Iraq for many months now. Even if we include the three spectacular series of bombing in, in, bombings in Baghdad, August, October, and earlier this month, that were all aimed at government buildings and through them at the political process and the approaching general elections, the general trend just mentioned is still very valid. And this is a very positive development which Iraq is undergoing, the benefits of which are enjoyed by all political groupings and ethnic sects. Although the grievances between some of these sects and most particularly those shared by the Sunni Arabs are still, still exist, it seems that the boycott of 2005 national parliamentary elections will not repeat itself. Hence, the final results may be yet another contribution to Iraq's gradual return to normalcy. However, in a conference that takes place here in Jerusalem, one cannot resist the temptation to quote to you yet another sign of normalcy, not, the, not exactly a positive one, but definitely a sign of normalcy, which was expressed in the vocabulary used yesterday uh, in the, by an emerging Sunni tribal leader who told the New York Times correspondent in Baghdad the following. He was referring to the recently passed law by Iraqi parliament on the Iraqi upcoming election. And he denounced the new election law and said, I quote verbatim, 
This is a Zionist conspiracy to partition Iraq into artificial entities, end of quote. I guess this, the validity of and relevance of such an expression needs no further interpretation or expression or explanation in this August gathering, and, um, but this is yet another indication that things in Iraq, uh, Iraq is falling into the general term or general form of uh, realities of the Middle East. Now in this session we have four speakers. I'll introduce them uh, in the order that they appear. Uh, each will speak. If you have questions, please note them down, write them down. At the end of all presentations, we'll take questions and try to our best to answer them and relate to them. Um, the first speaker is Professor Amatia Baram, who is a professor emeritus of Middle East history at the University of Haifa and the director of the Center for Iraq Studies at the University of Haifa. Professor Baram is a very known expert and actually a leading authority on Iraq, um, modern Iraq, and he is the author of numerous books and articles on the topic. Uh, I have a long list here, um, but I won't um, read it out right now. Um, I would also dare mention that he did his undergraduate studies at this university, and those of his professors who are here are very proud and uh, delighted to have him along with us. He also started his research, I believe, at the Truman Institute, which is the very, this very same building. And uh, without further ado, I'll call upon uh, Professor Baram to present his paper on identities in Iraq, 2003 to 2009. He was a wonderful teacher, and in fact, uh, I, li I listened to what uh, a student here told us about his, uh, uh, the support he's getting from university and so on. And I can say about uh, my uh, uh, alma mater, about the Hebrew U, that I really admired the teachers, and I still do. Uh, they were excellent, absolutely marvelous. I loved Jerusalem, I loved the Hebrew U, everything was great, I just hated the administration. <laughs> and the reason was that because I was a kibbutz kid, I studied at my own expense, I had to work and study. But because I was defined still as a kibbutz kid, they defined me as a millionaire who had all his money in his business and couldn't get it out of his business. And as a result, I never got any stipend until the Harry S. Truman stepped in. And then it was the sky was the limit. So uh, I had a wonderful time here. And whenever I come to the Harry S, I am very nostalgic. Um, Amnon, if you have any comments about what I say, tell me later, not, not to the face of the I listeners. I especially agree with your comments about the administration, which I also <laughs> dislike very much, but nothing doing. No institution can survive without that some administration. <laughs> so uh, what I'll try to do now is this. I'll talk only about the Arab part of Iraq, the Arab population of Iraq. I will not talk about the Kurds, not because the Kurds are not important, they are hugely important, of course. But uh, for that, Amnon, you'll have to give me 45 minutes. And because we agreed on much less, then it will have to be a part of the, of the issue. So the uh, ethnic, lingual, cultural thing, uh, the Kurdish aspect will have to wait for another opportunity. However, the Shi'i Sunni thing amongst the Arabic speakers of Iraq is such a complex and fascinating subject that I think it will be enough for now. Um, one more thing in the way of explanation, introduction. I will try, do my very best, not to remain for very long, not, not long at all, at the level of 70,000 feet, look, you know, like in a U2, looking down or in a satellite, looking down, looking at the broad lines of things. That you can get everywhere. I will try as far as I can to go down as close as possible to the grassroots level, to try and explain to ourselves what happened in Iraq at the grassroots level between 2003 
and 2009. Uh, I'll say that the Sunni Shi'i civil war, the Kurds kept out of it by 99%. The Sunni Shi'i uh, civil war surprised me. I didn't think there would be, I, I was certain of, of tensions, but I wouldn't believe, I didn't believe there would be real war, and there was a real civil war with hundreds of thousands of casualties, with millions of uprooted people who left home, changed home in Iraq, or left for Jordan, Syria, and elsewhere. So that surprised me. And I'll explain what happened that I didn't foresee. The fact that the Kurds stayed out of this when it started didn't surprise me. The fact that the Arab Sunni tribes will become a very, very central part of the problem, of the fighting, of the bloodshed, of aggression, did not surprise me at all once things started to move in that direction. And the fact that the tribes were also the main solution to the problem, to the civil war, was something I tried to explain to American officials for two years, two and a half years. And yet nothing happened. When they turned to the tribe at long last, in late 2000, mainly in late 2006, after more than three years of controlling Iraq, when they did that, the problem was essentially, not 100%, but essentially solved. The Sunni tribes were the, 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 one of the two main problems. The Sunni tribes were the main solution. So that did not su uh, surprise me at all. Uh, uh, Petraeus, David Petraeus and his policy in Iraq, the commander of the um, of the coalition forces and so on. This policy was something which I thought they should have done three years before. However, why did the sectarian Sunni Shi civil war uh, actually start? Why did it start? On the Shi'i side, I won't go very long in discussing the historical sediments of bitterness, of, uh, of uh, mistrust, of of uh, here and there oppression, of discrimination. I won't even go into that. We know about it quite a lot. Either we are talking about 80 years of such or about 500 years of such, doesn't really matter. Under Saddam, things go, g got much worse and I explain why. But basically, that's one, th that's only a background. And I want to make it very clear that this background does not explain the civil war because this background has been there since, the, the, let's say, the early 16th century, when at long last the Ottoman Empire got uh, a firm hold over Iraq. So the problem was there. Uh, but very rarely did it, uh, did it bleed to bloodshed. And when it did, the two main cases, when there was a Safavi occupation of uh, uh, Iraq in the, in, the, in the 16th century, for a while, and then in 1801, a Wahhabi occupation of Kabbalah, well, there was a bloodshed, there was a lot of bloodshed, but this came from outside. So that in itself is, not, is insufficient to explain. Uh, the first reason for what happened was the 10 years of Saddam Hussein's Al-Hamla Al-Imaniyya, Yani, the faith campaign. Again, it's a complex phenomenon. But on the whole, Saddam jumped on the bandwagon of Islamization, which started in Iraq from the grassroots, both in the Shi'i camp and the Sunni camp, around the late 80s. Late 80s, 1990, 91, after the Gulf War. And he, when he jumped on the bandwagon, he gave it a huge push forward. The result was very surprising, and even to him, uh, I think, quite disappointing. Uh, how do I know that? Uh, because his son gave vent to disappointment, Uday, this wonderful, unrecognized humanitarian, Uday. 
he, he gave vent to this sense of frustration. Saddam couldn't do that, it was his policy. But Uday did. What happened was interesting. On the Sunni side, this Islamization gave the regime a breathing space on the Sunni side, but not without long-term, very, very dire consequences. Already you had in Iraq in the late 1990s a fairly large group of Wahhabis. Now, Uday called them, called them Wahhabis. There were Salafis, Wahhabis, whatever. They were really very, very radical Islamists, extremists. And they were enemies of the regime. They were also enemies of Saudi Arabia, so Saddam tolerated them, but Uday said we should chop off all their heads. Eventually they didn't, but when the, the regime fell, if immediately um, the Americans realized something was wrong in the Sunni area. So that happened in the Sunni area, but short term it gave Saddam some pause. Some, some relief. In the Shi area, not at all. In the Shi area, when you uh, encourage people to go to the mosque, while beforehand you tried to prevent them from doing that, the result was very problematic. Shi identity became much more pronounced. And many people went to the mosque, even though they were not really religious. It's just that it was a place now not, not, da not dangerous anymore. And they could go there and feel the togetherness, which was very important for them. It was community. I have American friends in Washington, D.C., who belong to the modern uh, Orthodox, uh, Bet Knesset, whatever. And I asked them, do you believe in God? And they said to me, Anatsia, what are you talking about? Does it matter? We are going to the shul in order to meet our friends. This is a social, this is a community business. Whoever asks you such a question? I mean, you are coming from Hashomer Hatzair. Okay, you are looking into the, the, the totally unimportant. And many Shi'is who were like that went to the mosque. But when they went to the mosque, the central, central uh, figure at the mosque was the preacher or the imam. And sometimes the imam is also the preacher, imam and khatib sometimes. Uh, unia personality, personal union. So same person. But especially not so much in Najaf, not so much in Kabbalah, in the small towns, in the villages, in the Husseiniya, which is a tiny little mosque. This created a new leadership in the, or helped create, uh, in the Shi camp, the Molas, the low level, uh, uh, low middle level clerics, ulama. And these guys were Muqtada Sadr, Sadr's uh, storm, storm troops, crack troops, once the American conquered Iraq, once Saddam Hussein and his regime were kicked out of power. All of a sudden, whoosh, like this, uh, I have a friend, uh, he is uh, born and bred in Basra. His name is Naim al mazini If anybody ever meets him, give him my regards. Uh, Naim was born and bred in Basra. He participated, he was one of the leaders of the revolt in Basra against Saddam in 1991, after the Gulf War was over. And uh, you know that this uh, Shia revolt, or Intifada, or Intifada uh, Shaban, was crushed by Saddam with horrendous ferocity. We know that. He fled, and his friends, they fled to Saudi Arabia, and the Americans picked him up from Saudi Arabia, brought him to America, made him an American citizen. A wonderful guy. He said to me, an engineer by education, he said to me, after one year in Iraq, uh, working with the British, 2003, 2004, he came for holiday for a vacation in DC and we had a big dinner. And he said to me, Amatia, I cannot believe what happened in 10 years that I haven't been there in Iraq. I just cannot believe that. 12 years, whatever, 1991, 2003. The mullahs, these good-for-nothing idiots, uneducated, complete morons, they are becoming the leaders of the community. Everybody wants to know what they are saying. And what they say, I do. He said, I don't recognize Basra at all. And that, by the way, was classical of many other places. Interestingly enough, not so much in Najaf and Kabbalah, where you had the most senior ulama, and also they were not ignorant at all. Okay, so you had these... This strengthens the Shi identity, and to my mind, had the Americans not conquered Iraq, Saddam would have had another intifada a few years later. Number three, 
the Americans made a big mistake by not, dis not disarming all the militias right away from the moment they invaded Iraq. This was a terrible mistake. A mistake. They compromised, but there was a big mistake because this allowed Muqtada Sadr to build his Jaysh uh, al-Mahdi, uh, the Mahdi army, and uh, Badr Brigade to come. They came with their weapons, you know, thousands of them. Two days after, after Baghdad was conquered, they came in bus, bus loads from Iran, crossed the border, and immediately you have three, or three and a half thousand fighters, well trained by the Iranians, and wielding weapons. And that's the opposite camp within the Shi'i community, the Hakim family, or the Badr Brigade, or uh, Iski, or Skiri, or whatever you call them. Let's call them Hakim, okay? The Hakims. So you have the Sadr's, with their huge militia of probably eventually 60,000 people, and you have the Hakims, which are much smaller militia, but still well-armed and well-trained. And you started having local militias in the Sunni areas. Americans didn't have enough boots on the ground, whatever, they didn't do it. The result was that all of a sudden you have two armed camps, three actually, two Shi'i, one Sunni, facing each other, each other, all the three. Uh, l last but not least, of course, no, one before last. Car bombs, the Sunnis, with, uh, it was not yet Al-Qaeda, it was uh, uh, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. He eventually declared himself to be Al-Qaeda in Iraq, so we should just call them Al-Qaeda. But it's not, even today, it's not exactly um, Bin Laden's Qaeda. Whatever, they started killing Shiites right, left, and center. It was horrendous. Uh, you know, car bombs, what we had in Tel Aviv, what we had in Jerusalem, is, is very little in, by comparison, really very little, including on, on very important and the most important um, uh, commemoration days of the Shia, the Ashura, in Najaf and in Kabbalah. It's a very heart where you have a million and a half people coming for pilgrimage. That was, and each time 200 people die, 300 people die, 500, 700 are wounded. It's like a disaster. And in little markets and so on. All of them civilians, of course, all, almost all. The reason why, didn't, uh, why the civil war didn't start, start right then, 2004, in full, full uh, strength is that uh, Ayatollah Ali Sistani, Grand Ayatollah Ali, the Marja Taklid, announced that it would be a sin to revenge. He said, no revenge, no revenge. And there were a few cases when people came to him and said, the Sunnis killed my family. They killed everybody. I mean, we need to do something. What shall we do? He said, be patient. That was his advice. An amazing approach. And actually, the other senior Ayatollahs supported him. So that prevented it from going full, fully fledged. But it was bad enough in 2004 already. And then you have the identity business. You know that the radical Sunnis, uh, the, 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 if they are Wahhabis or if they are um, uh, Salafis, or the, how the, the Shiites call them um, um, takfiris, takfiri, uh, takfiriyin, takfiriyun, those who declare somebody else kafir. Uh, 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 this, it was very offensive. They call them al ridda uh, which means basically apostates. They call the Shia Arrafida, those who actually reject Islam. They call them uh, what? Uh, kuffar, of course. Um, this was this was quite quite uh, offensive. So you had this identity business, and you had the killing. And all everything came together, and you had the militias, the, or the armed militias, who could do something if they really had the, the guts to, to do it. All this. Uh, did not bring uh, the, the civil war to its, ha to its head until the al atab al, al Askariya, the uh, Askari shrine in Samara was blown up and nobody knows to this very day who blew it up. Uh, but when that was blown up, that's the place where the father of the 12th Imam, or the Imam Mahdi, who is supposed to arrive by the end of the day, the end of days and redeem the world and make everybody Shia, of course, and kill everybody who's not a Shia. It's a very nice Mahdi. So uh, that's the place where his, his father and his grandfather are buried. 
There is today a, a new, I don't know if you, maybe you heard that, a new theory that uh, Shiites are coming up with. And, and they are telling me, Amatia, do you know who blew it up? Because it was believed, widely believed it was Al-Qaeda. Okay, it makes sense. But, pardon? No, well, that Ba'ath and Qaeda worked sort of together. No, 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 it's a much more original idea. I didn't think about it, I should have. They said, look, the Americans did it. Why did the Americans, and it's not the Zionists, that, no, 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 no. This is much more logical. The Americans did it because in this grave, you have both the, the father and grandfather of the Mahdi buried. They took a sample of their genes. And now they are going to test every Iraqi and to see if he is the Mahdi. <laughs> and if he is the Mahdi, off with his head. And that's why they blew up the shrine. So you have all sorts of theories, but what happened on the spot was that the Mahdi army, who see themselves as carrying the burden of preparing the ground, preparing the paving the road for the arrival of the Mahdi. They are the Mahdi's army, after all. They saw this as a slap in the face by the Sunnis. Because we represent the Mahdi, and Muqtada Sada said many times, if you want to repent, a tawbah, a tawbah, repentance, come to my offices, because my offices represent the Mahdi. He said it. So they really see themselves as such, saw themselves. And in, in February 2006, this was blew up, blown up, so they felt that they had to do something about it. And they started slaughtering Sunnis right, left, and center, without any limitation. Uh, Sistani failed. So this is, this, this is how things moved up to the moment of explosion. Now, on the Sunni side, on the Sunni side, you had many reasons why they were up in arms. But the most important reason is that they were kicked out of an, an advantageous position. Very simple. 20% population or 19% or 21%, no one knows for sure, uh, who, who were the hegemonic power in Iraq since 1920-21, since the British brought, even before that, but mainly when they brought King Faisal I to be king of Iraq. And his elite was essentially Sunni, some Shiites, of course, but essentially Sunni. And, and the Sunnis, all of a sudden, are at a disadvantage. They are a minority, and they're no longer in power. And they were really angry. It was a matter of, a matter of identity. I would say, amazingly enough, in the first place, I spoke to, I don't know what, 60, no, more than 100 Sunnis during the, more than 100, because two courses that I, I taught in, 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 in DC and so on, and most of them were Sunnis. So I, I maybe 100, maybe 130, I don't know, more or less. And they quietly came to me, only privately, not, not in the group, because that's not nice, that's bad taste. But they said to me, Dr. Baram, what are you people doing? What are you? They thought that I was the, the, the tail that is wagging the American dog. So, you know. So what are you doing? What are you and your people doing? You are taking the Shiites for absolutely no good. No good. And, and they don't know how to run. They're, look at them, these ayatollahs with their towels around their heads. It's ridiculous people. And you are giving them Iraq. They cannot rule Iraq. They don't know how to. They have no experience. They have no knowledge. They are, they are a riffraff. And they called them Al-Furs. Yeah, these are actually Persians. You gave power to Persians. And they call them also, I had a few nice names they had for them. Uh, Al-Furs, uh, yeah, Rafida too. They, they call them very bad names. And they said, what are you doing? I said, look, I'm not doing anything. I'm just a university professor. I mean, so they would do this to me. You know. What do you mean? No, you are running the... It was very interesting. In any case, the point is that they felt that these guys had no knowledge, no, they didn't deserve where they were. We deserve to do the job. So it was an identity business. But you... How much? How much? Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, I, I never... Well, okay, I'll just try to, do, to be brief. Basically, uh, you had a lot of anxiety and bitterness because people lost their jobs. Bremer and his clique wrongly sent the army home and that de deprived lots of people of, of 
of livelihood, of professional pride, and of place in their society as officers uh, in the Iraqi military. So that also, that was very, very important. There were a few other reasons, uh, but I would say very, very briefly, th th these were the main reasons. And all of, all, at a certain point, uh, every day in Iraq, every day in Iraq, 100 people died between Sunni and Shi. Uh, what happened? How did it change? I'll just say that the main change came to the Sunnis, as I always believed it would. First of all, they realized that the Shia are stronger. The Shia are going to cut them to pieces because the Sunnis no longer had tanks, uh, artillery, uh, helicopter gunships, whatever. So now they are exposed. So they were really, they were gripped by fear and perfectly legitimate. Number two, the Americans all of a sudden changed their attack. It started in uh, 2005, but mainly late 2006 and then early 2007. They started engaging the Sunni tribes after a long time that they refused to do it. Washington refused. And you know who led this engagement? It was as soon as, pre as President Bush realized that if he didn't do that, Iraq was lost. And his commander told him, Iraq is lost. I'm talking about September 2006. He spearheaded this whole thing. He encouraged people. People don't know that. But he went four times, four times to Anbar. Anbar is a Sunni area between Baghdad and, uh, and uh, the Jordan and, and Syrian borders. And he really spearheaded the whole thing. And this worked beautifully because the, the, the tribes by then needed sustenance, they needed money, they were left with nothing. They needed uh, security, and the Americans offered them se security. They needed a sense that somebody is helping them because they were under a huge threat from the Shiites. And that was a moment when the Americans stepped in and they established militias and so on. The moment the Sunnis no longer were working with Al-Qaeda, and Al-Qaeda, there are a whole list of things Al-Qaeda did, and Al-Qaeda Al -Qaeda do it everywhere they go. They did it in Chechnya, they did it in Iraq, in Afghanistan it's a different problem altogether. But in Iraq they tried to impose their Islam on the local population, Sunni population. And the Sunnis were up in arms, and they murdered people, and they raped, and they did horrible things, horrible. So that all together brought these guys to start fight. And they killed people, so now you have blood for you, blood for you had to kill these guys, Al-Qaeda. That's how it started. The moment this cooperation with the Americans started in earnest, it caught like, like fire in a, in a, in a dry uh, field. It was unbelievable. Between the end of 2006 and the end of 2007, in 12 months, uh, uh, um, Casualties went down by 80 to 85 percent, both American casualties and Iraqi casualties. The moment the Shiites didn't need the Mahdi army, Jesh al-Mahdi, who were just riffraff, Shiites told me what they thought about Jesh al-Mahdi when they still needed them. They said to me, these guys are, 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 you know what it is, right? It's riffraff, riffraff. These guys are, are lusus, lusus. They are robbers. But if we need them, we need them against the Sunnis. But now they don't need them anymore. The result was that they lost a lot of their prestige. And I just end by saying, there were elections for local authorities in, uh, in um, uh, January of this year. In that election already you saw a shift, a very interesting shift. People shifted away from purely sectarian uh, slogans to a more Iraqi thing. And Maliki, the prime minister, got the message before it happened, and he knew. The others didn't quite do that. And so he won in a big way, never a majority, but substantial gains in the elections of January. Now, in, in, in March, there is a second uh, parliamentary elections, the main elections. I cannot predict what's going to happen. I'll just say that at least it is clear today 
that everybody is trying to show that they are really Iraqi and not Shi'i or Sunni. It's becoming bon ton. So I remember how David, David Ben-Gurion uh, had Bechor Shitrit as minister of police. Do you remember when I was a child? You don't remember, anyway. But he wanted to show that even Moroccans are members of my government. But it didn't mean very much. And the Moroccans knew that, of course. These guys are doing the same now, trying to get each of the, of the big Shi lists has now monopolized one important tribal chief uh, of the Sunni community, a tribal Sunni chief, and he is on their list to show, and the names, the names of the lists are very Iraqi, patriotic, Iraqi, national, not Shi'i, Sunni, and so on. That's important, but I'll just say that the rift is still there. It's going to haunt Iraq for a very long time. The hope is that it can be non-violent, that it can be a matter of horse trade between the communities, so eventually everybody in Iraq, and it seems to be it's moving in that direction. There are many um, reservations I could add here and here, but it, I'd still say it seems to me to be moving in that direction, and the trick is how when the new parliament convenes and the new government is being uh, uh, built, uh, how you make sure that everybody is reasonably unhappy. Because if they are unreasonably unhappy, there will be war. If they are unreasonably happy, they don't understand what they agreed to. So it has to be reasonably unhappy. And I'll just say one more sentence on Iran. I think the Iranians are very unhappy now, are almost unreasonably unhappy. Why? Because they think that Maliki, the prime minister, owes them a lot, and he does. They did for him wonderful things, I must say that. But now they want him to join the main body of Shia parties who are very pro-Iranian, but he knows that most Iraqi Shias do not want Iranian hegemony in Iraq. Shia, Shia, yes, but let them stay in Iran, we are Arabs. It's a bit different, it's not a war, but it's, it's different. And there is lots of suspicion and reservations and, and fear that the, the huge neighbor, God knows what they'll do to us. Uh, so, and the, 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 the oil, the oil well which they took was just a, a symbol of what they can do. They can do anything they want. So, Maliki decided that in order to win the elections, he cannot look too pro-Iran, Iranian. And the big block, Shi block, is pro-Iranian. So he is not joining the big block. The Iranians are very angry, are boiling. And I think that what they are saying to each other is basically what this guy, uh, some of you I know know about him, um, this guy, um, oh, um, uh, where is it? It's a beautiful poem, but I, I don't remember it by heart. I had to write it down for myself. Oh, uh, well, anyway, there is this, uh, do you, who, know, who remembers here, maybe, oh, blah, I really forgot to write it down. No, no here it is, uh, never give up. Those of you who heard about Man bin Aus bin Nasser bin Ziyad al-Mazini, uh, he, he was bin Muhadrimi al-Jahiliya wal-Islam. He lived both, in both eras. And he composed a little poem. It's a part of it. He said, "Uallimuhu arrimaya kull yawmin, walama shtada saiduhu ramani, wa kam allimtuhu nazm al qawafi, walama qala qafiyatan hajani." Later, I'll translate. <laughs> Let me assure you that the poem had very much to do with the, tech, with the lecture, so it was very much apropos, but I won't go on uh, translating it. We move straight ahead to our next speaker, Dr. Leora Lukitz. Uh, Dr. Lukitz received her doctorate at the London School of Economics and Political Science and was a research fellow at Harvard. She's currently a lecturer at Afeka College Engineering, Tel Aviv, and 
Haute Broad College of Engineering, Carmiel. She's the author of a book, a, a Quest in the Middle East, Gertrude Bell and the Making of Modern Iraq, 1940-1930. Her current research focus says on ethnicity, nationalism, and Islam in Iraq of 2000, year of the 2000s. And let me add in passing, she, she also was a student of Afdis University, and we are very proud to have her with us. Uh, Dr. Lukic will speak on constitutions and beyond unwritten pacts in the, in the reconstruction of nations. Dr. Lukic, please. It's always difficult to speak after Amatia, he's so powerful, but I try my best. And I want to say that I was also a student here at university, but I didn't have any contact with the administration. But one of the, one of the gifts that I got from this institution was uh, we, all, we, we all have gifts from the institutions we, we, we belong to at one point, was a wonderful book that reminds me always, that takes me back to, to rethink the whole thing that I'm doing. And it was a book referred by in this university, and the book is Mary Douglas, uh, How Institutions Think, uh, which was used, among others, to understand the inner logic of all kinds of organizations, among them radical Islam Islamic movement. The main, the main idea wasn't yet used to understand phenomena whose acuity grew with time, nor was it used to analyze our own perceptions of them. Namely, how do we think, especially at a time when, if quoting Oliver Roy's political of chaos in the Middle East, old categories have changed places and began to overlap. The revision of some of the books, focusing on national integration, brought me back to Anthony Birch's Nationalism and National Integration, uh, published in Boston in 89, in which the author tries to relate theory to practice and expose some mechanisms to cope with cultural minorities or majorities imperfectly integrated in the national uh, process. This paper will, for lack of time, focus on these specific mechanisms only by touching the broader question of nationalism and confessionalism when directly connected with the improvement of these mechanisms. It is, however, important to note that nationalism, such an influential and misunderstood doctrine, means different things to different people. It remains a phenomenon connected with culture and history in France, with language in Germany, and with religion in Pakistan. It reflects more than subjective feelings as explained by Martin Thiel in his article national, national, uh, Nation State and States of Mind, meaning nationalism as a psychology. Thiel attempts to explain the emotive and psychological appeal of nationalism reinforces Birch's argument that the search for a purely social or cultural definition of nationalism and confessionalism for the matter is ultimately fruitless. What emerges as important, therefore, is the feeling not always clearly formulated that the nation's institutions represent all the cultural group groups sharing the same national territory. This feeling is what redefines long-run trends of national assimilation or differentiation. In this context, it is also important to refer again to models of nationalism by comparing multicultural to the melting pot models and see which one is the more compatible with the realities in the Middle East. I say compatible not on the theoretical level but on the practical level, which means the models with which the inhabitants of these countries could, could identify better. In a nutshell, I would say that a multi multicultural system modeled on, say, Canada or the UK would be more compatible with the realities in countries such as Iraq and Lebanon. But there are also differences in the way they perceive it. Iraqis believe in integration, whereas Lebanese accept the idea of multiculturalism, at least on the practical level, for an interim period of time. In other words, given the different ideas of what it takes to preserve a nation, the Lebanese consider ethnicity and cultural religious links as assets, whereas the Arab nations, Iraq included, consider these as 
these categorizations and liabilities. But together with this underlying idea of a nation, there are tactics and mechanisms to preserve it. In other words, the nation system of maintenance. And one of the system's main mechanisms of maintenance is the constitution. Constitutions emerge in both countries, not just as part of the system maintenance tactics, but also as repairing mechanisms. That is, as a means to mend the ruptures in society and stabilize a political process that would, if correctly implemented, re-energize the national process. A comparison of Iraq and Lebanese constitutional texts points therefore to differences and similarities in their idea of the nation and in the definition of their own societies. A priori, the main differences resi resides in the fact that religious differences had traditionally overriding importance in defining Lebanese populations, whereas their importance was minimized during Iraq's uh, formative years and during the bath. It was believed that sunni shi bonds based on ethnical, linguistic, and national common interest overrode sectarian differences. While religious differences meant Christian-Muslim contests for political supremacy in Lebanon, this referred to a rift within Islam that would challenge the idea of an Iraqi nation even if the inner struggle between the groups was not just about the fruits of office, as it's usually believed, but also about the greatest say on, in defining Iraq's national identity. While in Lebanon, the patterns of settlement have changed little since the 17th century, Iraq's population was prone to greater social mobility, a result of wrong economic policies generated by political inequalities during the first decade of, independ of independence and badly imp implemented melting pot measures during the 60s and the 70s. What resulted were, were artificial areas such as Sadr City or enforced transfer of population that were a result of attempts to Arabi, Arabize Kurdish areas that are now Kurdicized. Um, while in Lebanon, the division, of, the division of state power between religion and sex granted ju judicial power on personal status to religious authorities, the famous tribal criminal civil dispute organization instituted by the British was considered an imperialist divide and conquer political measures and detrimental to national cohesion. So the definition of the problem in Lebanon, a recognition of group divisions and temporary division of power was expressed politically in the constitutional text and was considered a successful formula until demographical changes entitled Muslims to challenge this balance of power. The non-recognition of these changes in the constitutional text brought to a civil war in 75 that lasted 15 years. The definition of the problem in Iraq was different, based mainly on the rate and pace of the population's assimilation to the idea of, nas of secular nationalism implemented by the Ba'ath. But all these were tempered by unwritten pacts. Among them, the 1943 National Pact, al mithaq al Watani, that formalized Lebanon's independence and led the foundation of Lebanon as a multi-confessional state with power positions divided according to the 1932 census. The pact underwrites the country's politi politics to this day according to the Christians the presidency, the command of the armed forces, and until recently, a, a parliament majority. But Christians' immigration in large numbers increased dissatisfaction with the government structure. The Taif Agreement of, of uh, 1989 that brought to an end of the civil, civil war reduced the power of the Marinese president, removed built-in Christian majority, distributed seats equally between Christians and Muslims, and accorded more power to the Sunni elite and to the Sunni majority. In other words, the Taif Agreement reiterated the provisions of the 1943 National Park, Pact by, by which the Christians undertook not to see foreign interventions and accept Lebanon as an Arab-affiliated country, while the Muslims abandoned, tactic at least, their aspiration to unite with Syria. It was a tac tacit understanding of the changes that had taken place without recurring to measures such as a organization of a new census, which all groups wanted to avoid. 
There are other major differences in the way Lebanese and Iraqis see their societies. Artic Article 24 of the uh, Lebanese constitution refers to the distribution of office on the basis of confessionalism as an interim measure that is until such time when the chamber enacts a new electoral laws on a non-confessional basis. This article is rightly considered by Muslims within Lebanon and outside it as a measure that seeks to perpetuate sectarianism. Another major difference is the way by which the Taif Agreement attempted to maximize, theoretically at least, cross-confessional cooperation, if, even if in practice the practical results were quite different. That is, electoral districts or constituencies were modified modify their boundaries for electoral, for electoral purposes, which is happening in, in Iraq as well, at, at the, as we know. But this kind of arrangement also made possible the emergence of political blocs based on confessional and local interest and personal family allegiances rather than political affinities. Inequities also characterize Lebanon's judicial system that in spite of being based on the Napoleon, Napoleonic Code, uh, accorded the, the religious court's substantial role in personal status affairs. All this is to say that Lebanese political institutions play a second role to highly confessionalized, personally based politics where powerful family managed to mobilize votes for local and parliamentary elections. Having all the above in mind, one could ask, what could be learned from the Lebanese experience and be further applied to Iraq's case. If we take the Iraqi constitution as a point of departure, we see, that we see it as a tool to create, rather than just maintain, a political system that doesn't always reflect the realities on the ground. Also articles such as Article 10 that establish the educational rights for all religious uh, communities provided they follow the state's public uh, institutional ro rules, seem to have been adapted from the Lebanese constitution. Others, such as the famous 24, uh, Article 24, uh, which, uh, which stipulates the proportional representation among the confessional groups, cannot be easily transported to the Iraq's reality. That mainly because of Iraqi self-image, what Amatya just uh, developed, an, un an outcome from an educational system that drew on unification and integration as a basis for nationalism. But do we and, and them really understand confessionalism in its broader meaning? The original idea of confessionalism, which is also defined in other fields as consociationalism, is a form of government that is often suggested as the simplest mechanism to manage conflict in deeply divided societies because it guarantees group representation. One of the main authorities in constitutionalism is uh, Liebhardt, who traced or the origins back to 1970 when Netherlands was divided into four territorial pillars, Calvinists, Catholic, Socialist, and Liberal. That's an idea to follow. Each current with its own schools, newspapers, hospitals, all divided along a pillarized social structure, which doesn't mean a, sec a sectarian structure. The key, the key for the system was the social elite's agreement to collaborate in order to create a stable democracy. It worked because their goals were similar, which means governance stability, survival of power sharing, and the recognition of the dangers of non-cooperation. It also implied a consensus regarding the majority rule. Consociationalism along religious confessional lines is what we call today confessionalism. That, theoretically at least, guarantees representation based on per percentage of population in the state's institution, among them the police force, parliament, civil service, etc. But criticism on constitutionalism focuses on the divisive nature of a system based on diverging identities based on ethnicity, as opposed to what was thought to be integrating identities based on class, and on the fact that constitutionalism 
institutionalized and entrenches div divisions among groups. It also relies on, on rival multi-ethnic cooperation, which is, in the view of some, inherently unher unstable. The doctrine also assumes that each group is cohesive and has a strong leadership, which is not always the case. So what you come up with is that the Lebanese pattern, aiming at the accommodation of community, state, and nation, creates in fact a situation in which two main intertwining concepts, nationalism and communalism, play themselves out sometimes in disguise. In other words, to better understand what it takes in order to advance the process of national reconciliation in Iraq and Lebanon, we have to spot milestones and, and, and measure difficulties in varying degrees. And that's what, in my view, didn't happen because the, the system was so polarized and everybody just thought in one way, so the, 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 the attenuating effect of varying degrees was not really applied to the to the analysis of the phenomena in Iraq and Lebanon. And if I want to mention another institution that, uh, that helped me in my career, so that was Harvard, and that's where I, where I, where I learned the, the varying degrees concept. Everything is right, but in varying degrees. Okay, so what I would call for in this paper would be for constitutions and beyond unwritten pacts in disguise. The importance of the un underlying messages is enormous at the time when Lebanon and Iraq are at crossroads. One of the preconditions for nation building in fragmented political cultures is the ruling elite's ability to accommodate different and sometimes conflicting sentiments. This ability was to be assessed by anal analyzing the disruptions that afflicted the Lebanese and the Iraqi political processes during the last decades. Lebanon's politics during the first republic that was from 1920 to 43 under the French mandate and the third republic from 89 to 2005 that brought to the Taif agreement and the withdrawal of Syrian troops reflected an attempt to accommodate constitutional arrangements whereas the second republic, the 43-75 one, was characterized by a resistance to, the, to an apparent status quo. Another precondition of uh, nation buildings is the elite disposition to defend the system, to defend the system um, and to improve it. A first conclusion would therefore would be the need to refine mechanisms, institutions and definitions to sort out differences, that is, consolidate democratic institutions rather than engage in engineering a common identity. It would also imply a redefinition of multiculturalism as a basis for identity, and it would also imply a redefinition of multiculturalism for diversity and creativity rather than an arena for political battlefield. By the same token, Refining the concept of nationalism would help Lebanon and Iraq regulate the ebb and flow of communal feelings and the fear of engulfment in regional identities affecting the freedom and the way of life of other groups in society. In a nutshell, I would conclude by saying that we have to find better ways to give these people an idea of how to share a state and still negotiate a nation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lukic, for uh, widening the scope of our uh, approach and um, giving us some um, interesting new approaches. And last but not least, for keeping right on time. <laughs> that's the most I forgot important. some papers here. That's and we move straight on. We move straight on to the uh, third speaker, who is Dr. Oren Barak. Dr. Oren Barak is a senior lecturer at the Department of Political Science and International Relations at the Hebrew U, working on the relationship between the state, society, and the military in the non-Western regions and in ethnic and national relations. Dr. Barak's recent book 
is called the Lebanese Army, a national institution in a divided society. It came out this, this year by State University of New York, 2009. And uh, he uh, also edited another book, which came out the same year, keeping yourself quite busy, Dr. Barak. Two, two books in a year, not bad at all. And I should also mention that he was a student of our department as well. So without further ado, uh, let me call on Dr. Oren Barak to present his paper on communal violence in Lebanon and Iraq in theoretical and comparative perspective. Dr. Barak, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, this paper is actually part of an ongoing research project that examines uh, three major interstate conflicts in the contemporary Middle East, in Lebanon, Iraq, and Israel-Palestine. From a broad comparative and theoretical perspective, the discussion of these conflicts is informed by and seeks to contribute to the study of interstate conflicts both generally and in the Middle East. It also aims to provide a better understanding of these conflicts themselves. Uh, more specifically, the project inquires about the causes of these conflicts, their dynamics, and the ways that they have been treated thus far. In addition, I consider the role played by various actors, domestic and external, regional and international, in these conflicts and their interplay. Today, I will compare two of these conflicts, the Civil War in Lebanon, 1975 to 1990, and the conflict that has been going on in Iraq since the US-led invasion of that country in 2003, focusing on the factors for their onset, only on the onset of these conflicts. The paper includes three sections. First, I discuss the general phenomenon of, uh, phenomenon of interstate conflicts and the main types of explanations for their outbreak that are found in the scholarly literature. I then focus on the two conflicts in Lebanon and Iraq and discuss the major factors that can account for the violence in each of these cases. And then I conclude by comparing the two conflicts and presenting my main conclusions, both with regard to these two cases, but also more generally. Now let me talk a little bit about interstate conflicts and their causes. Since 1945, interstate conflicts or civil wars, which occur particularly in the non-Western regions, have been far more prevalent and destructive than inter interstate wars. According to a study by Fearon and Layton from 2003, in the period 1945 to 1999, there were 25 interstate wars, which resulted in 3.3 million deaths. And this, during the same period, there were 127 civil wars, which occurred in 73 states, that is about one-third of the members of the UN, and resulted in an estimated 16.2 million casualties, that is about five times the number of deaths in interstate conflicts. Interstate conflicts also lasted longer and caused more damage to infrastructure and more refugees than wars between states. Now, students of interstate conflicts, who include area specialists, political scientists, students of international relations, political sociologists, and political economists, present quite different explanations for the onset of these conflicts. Broadly speaking, these explanations fall within three main categories of explanations for political behavior, that is rationalist explanations, culturalist explanations, and structuralist explanations. Let me briefly discuss and illustrate these different explanations. First, uh, the cultural explanations, what I might say called cultural, the cultural business. Cultural explanations for interstate conflicts emphasize the collective identity of the groups involved in these conflicts. One type of culturalist, culturalist explanation speaks of ancient hatreds between these groups, that is, long-term animosities between their members, which lie at the core of their conflict. A second culturalist factor is for conflict is the group's ontological security, that is the extent to which its collective identity is maintained through a co conflictual relationship with, with a significant other, in this case a rival group that is preserved despite the threat to the group's physical security. And in the cases of Lebanon and Iraq, numerous observers, including scholars and journalists, have offered culturalist ex explanations for the conflict, and I'll just mention two examples. First, the book From Beirut to Jerusalem by Tom Friedman, from 1989, he emphasizes the deep-seated animosities between Lebanon's sects, which lie at the heart of the conflict between them. And in 2004, when the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq and the subsequent nation-building proje project there ran into grave difficulties, Fouad Ajami observed that in its modern history, Iraq has not been kind or gentle to its people. Perhaps it was folly to think that it was under any obligation to be kinder to strangers. 
Now, now uh, I'll say something about the rationalist explanation. This is the second group of authors who discuss groups' leaders uh, who allegedly call on their supporters to use violence in order to advance their political or personal agendas, or armed bandits and thugs who use violence against members of other groups and sometimes also against members of their own groups in order to reap profits and other material dividends from the conflict. John Muller, who discusses the conflicts in, in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, writes, rather than reflecting deep historical pas passions and hatreds, the violence seems to have been the result of situ a situation in which common, opportunistic, sadistic, and often distinctly non-ideological marauders were recruited and permitted free reign by political authorities. Because such people are found in all societies, the events in Yugoslavia and Rwanda are not pecu peculiar to these locales, but could happen almost anywhere under the appropriate conditions. On the other hand, with different people in charge and with different policing and accommodation procedures, the savagery could have been avoided. And finally, structural explanations for interstate conflicts. Um, these explanations focus mainly on the weakening or disintegration of the state, which creates a quote-unquote security dilemma for the major sectors of society, much like individual states in the quote-unquote anarchical international system. Again, in, in, with regard to the former Yugoslavia, Mary Posen argued that it was the disintegration of the Yugoslav state that compelled its major sector, the Serbs, Croats, Muslims, and so forth, to protect themselves, and that the result was escalation of their mutual relations. And other structuralist approaches to interstate conflicts focus on the process of uh, political and socioeconomic change, uh, namely modernization, uh, democratization, urbanization, um, and so forth, and how these processes are liable to enhance intergroup tensions and lead to interstate conflict. Let me also uh, mention the integrative approaches to these conflicts, which rather than adhering to, to uh, one of these, only one of these approaches and jettisoning the others or, or ignoring the others, try to integrate uh, rationalist, culturalist, and structuralist explanations for interstate conflicts, and this, uh, this I think, is, a, is the most fruitful way of looking at these very complex events that are interstate conflicts. This allows us, uh, the student of these conflicts to broaden his view and offer various explanations that then can be weighed, the relative importance can be weighed and, and engaged uh, after doing that. It takes a lot of work, but it's worth the effort, in my view. This is also the uh, what I'm trying to do in my own project and in, in the various publications that already uh, emerged from that. And let me now discuss very briefly the two conflicts and then uh, say some, uh, uh, talk a little bit of, uh, about their, uh, on the comparative dimension. Uh, the Lebanese conflict uh, first. This conflict resulted in tremendous loss of life, mass displacement and immigration, and considerable physical damage. Now the statistics, the official statistics speaks of 144,000 deaths and uh, close to 2,000 2, wounded. Uh, probably uh, the figures are higher than that. Uh, about one third of Lebanon's pre-war population of 3.1 million left the country. Some of them just went back and forth, but ma many left never to return. Uh, and these included uh, 200,000 professionals. Um, as brain drain from Lebanon during the Civil War, and uh, internal displacement reach about, reached about uh, 800,000, and uh, the damage to property was uh, an estimated $25 billion. And in view of the fact that Lebanon was a regional hub uh, for banking trade, but also a tourist resort, the damage was, was uh, enormous uh, to Lebanon on account of the conflict. And when you try to explain the Lebanese conflict, the outbreak of the conflict, which I'm focusing on uh, here, can be explained uh, against the backdrop or by, by referring to the decline of, of the state and uh, its political security and bureaucratic institutions during the late 1960s and early 1970s, the growing inability of these institutions to cater to the needs and regu regulate the political demands of Lebanon's various communities uh, or ethnic groups, the large families or clans, and the geographical regions. These are the basic uh, building blocks of Lebanese society. And this in view of, of uh, major socioeconomic changes 
just such as modernization, urbanization, and changes in the de demographic equilibrium between uh, the various sectors that I mentioned. And there were, of course, uh, external factors that we, we all know about, and I won't say too much about them, except that they helped disrupt the process of elite accommodation, again, quoting Leipart, Arndt Leipart, uh, which is crucial to consociational or power-sharing uh, regimes. And when you look at the onset of the conflict in 1975, you see first a structural factor, the decline of the state, the creation of a security dilemma for Lebanese uh, sectors. This is a structuralist factor. The role of belligerent entrepreneurs, the militias within these sectors themselves, using violence both against one another and within the communities. This is a rationalist uh, factor. And finally, the long-term animosities, mutual apprehensions, and fears among uh, the Lebanese sector is a culturalist factor. And uh, a telling example of these processes and the interplay between them is the mobilization of the Maronite community before the, the Civil War, and specifically the Phalanx Party, when uh, Pierre Jumail, which was the leader of the Phalanx at that period, he declared, we oppose any militia, but unfortunately, every Lebanese finds themselves compelled to defend himself in the absence of a government that can protect him and his honor. This was in 74. In 75, he states, unfortunately, if you're not a wolf, the wolves will, will prey on you, and I don't want to be devoured by wolves. Now let me say uh, something uh, about Iraq. Now, uh, we heard about the, 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 the damage uh, in, in, in the Iraqi conflict, the, the casualties and the exodus of Iraqis from Iraq, so I won't repeat uh, the figures on that, that conflict. And uh, here you have uh, a quite different situation because I think uh, the major factor here is, is a structuralist one that uh, resulted from the, uh, the invasion of Iraq in 2003 and the disbandment of Iraq's political elite, the ruling Ba'ath Party, and the security sector, specifically the Iraqi army, all at the same time. I mean, this was the, the great American contribution to, to the stability of Iraq. And this series of events, very dramatic, following one, one another, practically pushed the country's various sectors, the, the, the Shi'is, the Sunnis, and the Kurds up north, to uh, a conflict which mainly was between uh, Sunnis and Shi'is, but uh, uh, was, as we heard, uh, a large-scale civil war. Now, uh, the dismantling of the state uh, created the security dilemma for these communities, and, but it also, at the same time, offered opportunities for belligerent entrepreneurs, quote unquote, within these sectors to assert themselves. Uh, I, we have here a rationalist factor. And again, a good example for, for this process is Muqtada al-Sadr, the Shi leader, but there are also many others, some of his contenders and, and from other communities. But what it also did, this dramatic change in Iraq, it fueled the long-term animosities, apprehensions, and fears among these sectors. While Sunnis resented the loss of their dominant position in the state, Shi'is and Kurds remembered Sunni atrocities against them, as well as how the U.S. has failed to come to their help during the 1991 uprising. There we have a, a culturalist factor at work. And this situation was exacerbated by the arrival of uh, volunteers, uh, both Arab and, and, and from, uh, from Iran, who came to fight uh, to protect their communities uh, or to fight uh, the American occupiers of Iraq and uh, the close neighbors of, of Iraq, which didn't intervene, like in the Lebanese conflict, physically because the Americans weren't there and no one was foolish enough to mess with them, but they sent aid and, 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 and uh, uh, people to fight in Iraq. And evidence for the significance of, of these factors and how they uh, uh, intertwined in the Iraqi case is provided by a very good article by Nero Zen who visited Iraq and he writes, it was Friday and like my companions I was going to the Friday prayers. I had been following the practice, this practice since I arrived in Iraq in April 2003 when it became clear that clerics were filling the power vacuum created by the war. After the fall of Saddam and his Ba'ath party, looting and anarchy gave way to forces of more organized violence. Men with guns, some wearing the turbans of clerics, some the scarves of the resistance, and many belonging to criminal gangs. Despite American intentions to create a secular democratic Iraq, clerics were quickly replacing Ba'athists, and in the absence of anything else, the mosque would become Iraq's most influential institution. And I think this, in this passage you see very nicely, 
or uh, horrendously, if you, if you want, the, the, the enmeshing of the cultural, structural, and, and rational uh, factors. And I'll now briefly, in, in the five minutes that I have, more or less, I'll try to compare the two, the two cases and, and say something uh, about that. Now, as I, as I mentioned earlier in Iraq, I think the major, major factor for the violence was the structural aspect, namely the dismantling of the state by the occupying forces, uh, uh, which resembles, I think, the, the process in the former Yugoslavia where the absence of the state uh, just created a security dilemma for the various sectors and, and practically forced them to uh, mobilize and to fight one another. And another aspect of, of that process was the opening of the borders with Iraq's neighbors, uh, which the Americans didn't control too well with Syria and Iran, which enabled volunteers and, 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 uh, and other forms of aid to come to help these communities fight one another. Um, and if it was not for these dramatic developments, the smatting of the army and the Ba'ath and the ruling elite, I think we, did, we wouldn't have uh, a civil war, not that, that the scope. Saddam Hussein did a, a very good job from his point of view of, of suppressing uh, um, uh, opposition within Iraq from, from the Kurds, from the, from the Shi'is, from, from the Sunnis, from practically everybody. And there's no reason why he wouldn't have continued doing so for, for some time at least. Um, but I also want to mention these entrepreneurs who seize the opportunity of this chaos, of, of, of this chaos and the absence of state institutions and jumped into the void and began to mobilize their communities by using uh, ethnic messages and, and symbols and rituals. And, and this is referred to in, in the literature as a fear of the future and, and, draw and, and uh, appealing to what is referred in the literature as a fear of the future lived through the past. Now in Lebanon, the state was far less powerful from the beginning and the authority vis-a-vis -vis the various uh, sectors was conditional from the outset. And in other words, the sectors never hinged uh, uh, or relied on the state to protect them when things get, got rough. So you see uh, the weakening of the state, but not a dismantling or disintegration, um, is uh, intertwined with the process of the rise of the militias, the uh, political actors, some of them who were uh, former gang leaders and now rebelled against the Zuama, the Lebanese uh, political leaders, and trying to use violence as a way to enter a, a what was, in their view, a closed political system. Um, and they uh, succeeded very well in, in this. Uh, if you look at the Lebanese parliament and government and high offices in recent years, you see many of the former uh, militia leaders, the Lebanese uh, militia leaders. Uh, another difference which I'd like to, to mention very briefly is uh, the external factor who, unlike the Iraqi case, was already in Lebanon, namely the Palestinians who joined with some of the Lebanese factions. Then you had the uh, the Syrian intervention, the Israeli invasion, and uh, uh, other regional aspects. Although, unlike the Iraqi case, you also had a moderating regional role in the form of mediation between the and Arab summits, which you don't or didn't have as much in the Iraqi case. And I think maybe this is a way um, that the Americans could pursue. Uh, but they have to learn the lesson of Lebanon for that, you know, to realize that. Um, so let me just conclude very briefly if, uh, because my time is up. So what I try to do is to talk briefly about each of the two uh, conflicts in Lebanon and Iraq and draw some uh, similarities and, and differences between these cases based on uh, the scholarly literature on interstate conflicts and the kind of explanations that you can find when looking at that literature. Um, and you see, I think, uh, the um, importance of the structuralist dimension of the Iraqi civil war, the pivotal role of, of that dismantling of the state and its institutions versus the Lebanese case where this factor is important but not that, not as much important. Um, so uh, this, this is one observation that I would mention. Uh, the weakness of the state in Lebanon from the beginning versus the strong state in Iraq dominated by one community suppressing the other two communities. Uh, so um, the importance of uh, relative importance of, of the culture of the re of the structural important of the factor was uh, different between the two cases. Um, you see a similar role of militias filling the void, uh, providing services to their communities, also claiming to protect them, using uh, ethnic symbols, 
the Falangs in Lebanon, the Marada, the Murabitun, Amal Hezbollah and, and all these in Lebanese case in Iraq as well. You have uh, militias speaking in ethnic terms, also in tribal uh, values. Um, and performing statist functions, policing, what they call policing, uh, smuggling, and, and, and all that. Uh, but in the Lebanese case, the militias, despite their, these activities, never uh, acquired legitimacy. They were always illegitimate compared to the state, uh, which uh, uh, retained its legitimacy, not always its, its, its uh, uh, proper functioning, but its legitimacy. Now in Iraq, the state from the begin with, f to begin with, was not uh, seen as legitimate by the oppressed communities, by the uh, Sunnis and Kurds, and Kurds, only partially legitimate, legitimate because of that factor, because it was dominated by the Sunni Arabs. And the Sunni Arabs used the state in order to suppress these two communities. So, um, uh, this, this is a, a major uh, difference between the two cases. And, uh, and there you see, uh, and the last factor that I would like to re-emphasize, emphasize again, is the American role in bringing this uh, chaotic situation to Iraq by systematically dismantling the, the institutions uh, of the state and trying to, they thought that, that what they were doing was nation building, but they haven't really looked at their previous experience in Japan, in Germany, where they actually they integrated many functionaries, former Japanese and former uh, German uh, bureaucrats into the administration. Uh, we know that very well. In Iraq, it was some kind of an idyllic nation building where you, you wipe the table out of uh, and, and, and throw out all the, uh, the uh, old guys and then try to recruit new guys and try to persuade them that they shouldn't think about sectarianism, and et cetera, and, and we see the, the results of that. So I'll, I'll stop here, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we are moving straight on to the last but not least presentation. The fourth presentation um, will be done by Dr. Omri Nir, who teaches um, at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and at Tel Aviv University and also at Ben Gurion University. And in, having said it, he still has a book already that is uh, forthcoming. Uh, on Nabih Berry and the Lebanese politics. He's forthcoming with Palgrave Macmillan. And he is going to um, discuss with us to lecture on sectarian politics in Lebanon, the Shiite case. Dr. Nick, please. Thanks very much. I also would like to thank the Abir Foundation for uh, make my uh, Lebanon seminar in this university possible. Thanks, uh, thanks to uh, their uh, gen generosity. I also want to thank the Lebanese politicians for raising the issue of sectarian politics to the top of the public agenda, agenda during uh, the last month. Since exactly one month ago on uh, November 22nd, said President Michel Sliman in his speech uh, on the Lebanese 66th uh, Independence Day that uh, to encourage vast participation in political life, a national committee should be established to deal with the abolishing of political sectarianism. This sentence, of course, uh, immediately uh, raised a political debate in which most of uh, the prominent Lebanese politicians participated in. Uh, speaker Nabi Berri, uh, Speaker of Parliament, who is also uh, the leader of the Shiite Amal uh, movement, said on this, uh, the next day actually, that if such a committee won't be established right now, I don't see many chances for Lebanon to survive. Two weeks later, he said on the same matter that a gradual abolishing of political sectarianism would fortify coexistence in Lebanon. Uh, Hassan Nasrallah, the Secretary, Secretary General of uh, Hezbollah, said during this uh, public debate, that political sectarianism, sectarianism is blocking the development of, uh, of the Lebanese political regime and standing as an obstacle in the face of a democracy where the majority rules and the minority opposes. Later, he also added that uh, abolishing political sectarianism is a basic condition for the implementation of a majority-minority rule in Lebanon. 
Drew's leader, Walid Jumblat, who just 10 days ago said uh, on the occasion of the 100th uh, birthday of his, of his uh, late father, Kamal Jumblat, that uh, my father, Kamal Jumblat, tried for 25 years to abolish sectarianism in politics, but he failed because uh, confessional forces, as well as cultural and religious interests, are more powerful than civil society in Lebanon. So as you see, uh, it's a great opportunity and good timing uh, to examine the idea of abolishing uh, sectarianism or sectarian politics in Lebanon, and I'm going to do it by giving some historical perspective and uh, by demonstrating uh, my point uh, uh, on uh, the Shiite experience in the Lebanese sectarian uh, life. Uh, the phrase sectarian politics immediately raise, raises in uh, our mind uh, the Lebanese case, of course, and the reason for that is quite obvious since we hear for many years about uh, rivalries and struggles between Maronites and Druze and between Maronites and Sunnites and uh, Sunnites and Shiites and between uh, Orthodox and Catholics and so on. Uh, the Lebanese political system, of course, is a sectarian one in which uh, the top political positions as well as the parliamentary seats are allocated according to uh, the distribu distribution of, uh, or actually according um, to the proportion of the population to 11 out of the 17 uh, uh, religious sects uh, of Lebanon. So the president is always a Christian Maronite, as you know, and the prime minister is a Sunnite. The Speaker of the Parliament is always a Shiite. The Vice Speaker of the Parliament is always an Orthodox. Uh, the Army Commander uh, is always a Maronite, and uh, so on. Now, sectarian, sectarian, sectarian political system in Lebanon uh, originated as early as in uh, the organic law, organic law of 1864. That time, it was still uh, the autonomic uh, Sanjak of Mount Lebanon, still uh, under the uh, control of uh, the Ottoman Empire. And in fact, that law set a, a, a precedent to the idea of allocating, or, or the idea of uh, distribution of political power uh, according that, uh, according the uh, uh, population, uh, um, uh, of uh, the different uh, religious sects. So that time in the uh, administrative uh, uh, council of Mount Lebanon, there were four Maronites, three Druze, uh, two Orthodox, one Catholic, one Shiite, and one Sunnite. Uh, paradoxical, that law also set the unjust and unproportional location of these seats, because it was well known that at that time in Mount Lebanon, the proportion of the uh, Maronite uh, population among the people of the mountain were at least 60 to 70 percent, while they got only one third of the 12th member uh, administrative council. So only four out of 12. So as we know, still today, even in the modern Lebanese state, and even today, this unjust and unproportioned allocation is uh, still uh, um, the situation. As we know, today the Shiite are probably between 60, uh, sorry, 30 to 35 percent of the Lebanese population, why they got only 21% of the seats in the parliament. They have only 27 seats out of 128. While the Maronites, for example, they got 34 seats in the parliament, while it is uh, probably uh, true that there are no more than 21 to 23 percent of the Lebanese population at uh, the maximum. The sectarian political system, or confessionalism, as uh, we heard before, became a built-in uh, in the modern Lebanese state after it for its formation 
in 1920. Uh, the Lebanese constitution of 1926 uh, reinforced or, or, or strengthened the idea of sectarian politics and so the uh, National Covenant of 1943, which set the political formula in Lebanon for the next 30 years until it collapsed uh, with the outbreak of the Civil War in 1975. The Taif Agreement of 1989, which ended that Civil War, uh, also uh, strengthened the idea of uh, sectarian politics in spite of the fact there was a clause uh, in that agreement uh, that uh, declares of intention to abolish political sectarianism in the, in the long run by a public committee, and this is the committee that uh, President Sliman uh, referred to uh, last month uh, in, in his last month's uh, speech. Now, there's another point which is relevant, that we see that uh, since the beginning of modern time in Lebanon, we saw that the Maronites and the Druze were the two major powers or two major uh, uh, sects, religious sects, that um, uh, actually took part in this competition of political hegemony. And when the modern state was, uh, inf was uh, formed in 1920, uh, the uh, Muslim Sunnites replaced the Druze as the uh, competitive against the Maronites on the political harmony, um, hegemony, sorry. Uh, and um, in the post-Civil War era, we are witnessing the Shiites and uh, the, the Sunnites as the major political actors in Lebanon. And these changes clearly show that um, um, that in Lebanese politics, the two prominent sects are the demographically largest ones. And this is very important uh, to remember that. So one can uh, discuss many aspects of the Lebanese sectarian politics regarding the inter-sectarian um, struggles, but uh, I would like to make my point here uh, and actually say that, uh, to my opinion, a sectarian political system encourages political pluralism and inter-sectarian cooperation because it creates rivalries or it creates struggles on the allocated parliamentary uh, seats within each of the religious sects. Um, this creates dualism within each of the religious communities concerning national and regional matters. And the result is that uh, the split on national and regional issues in Lebanon is not based on sectarian division. There is no one Maronite uh, approach towards a certain matter, and there is no uh, one Shiite policy, and there is no uh, one Sunnite uh, point of view. I would like to demonstrate my point shortly on the Shiite experience uh, in, uh, in Lebanon, which became a key, uh, a key uh, sect or religious community uh, after the end of the Civil War. Okay, since the formation of the Lebanese modern state in uh, 1920, uh, the struggle within the Shiite community uh, held a permanent pattern uh, of actually two prominent um, power centers, I would call it. One is the Al-Assad uh, Al uh, family or alliance, and the other one uh, is the uh, Osiran El Halil families, okay? Both families came from southern Lebanon, from Jabal Amal. Uh, and I didn't mention the uh, geographical aspect by incident because there's a, a close uh, association between the geographical aspect and the sectarian polit politics because each of these uh, two alliances associated itself 
with influential Shiite factors in the Baka Valley, okay, the, 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 the Lebanese Valley, uh, which is a second important Shiite uh, area. Uh, the El Assad associated it itself politically and matrimonially to the Hamada family, while the other alliance, the Osiran Khalil, associated itself with, <coughs> sorry, with uh, the Haider family of the Baka, which of course was the Hamada's rivals in the Baka Valley. In few cases, uh, the duality even split the families as struggles uh, for leadership within those families took, took place. In the 1920s, for example, the El Assad family or the, the Kamel El Assad, the head of the El Assad Alliance was uh, against the idea of, create, of, of uh, the creation of a separate Lebanese political entity from Syria, while his brother-in-law, Mohammed Atamar, uh, cooperated with the French mandate and even uh, participated in uh, pro-French uh, propaganda. The same was in the Haider family of the Baka. One faction, headed by Tofik Khilu Haider, determinedly opposed the idea of the Lebanese new state, while uh, the larger faction in the family, headed by Ibrahim Haider, cooperated with the Lebanese mandatory uh, administration, and he even uh, served in a high position uh, during the 1920s and 30s in uh, this uh, Lebanese um, administration of uh, the mandate of the mandate, okay? So duality continued uh, at the 50s. During the 1958 Lebanese crisis or Lebanese civil war, um, the El Assad alliance was pro-Nasserite pro and anti-Shamonist, anti-Western, while uh, the El Khalil family from the other alliance supported the pro-Western policy of President Kamil Shamonden and in fact, the two families strang uh, struggled on hegemony among the Shiite public and associated themselves with political al uh, allies outside the Shiite uh, circles or the Shiite community as well. In the 60s and 70s, the structure of Shiite politics was changed with the appearance of Musa Sadr, um, who was a, religi a, a religious scholar um, and he had a clear political aims and maybe even many personal uh, ambitions. Anyway, he was the life and soil uh, in the formation of the Supreme Shiite Islamic Council of Lebanon and later the movement of deprived and the Amal movement. So Sadr's success came on the cost of the Zuama on the cost of the feudal leaders, and the El Assads in particular. So uh, the outcome was, once again, not only a personal feud between the, between the two persons, but also a dual, uh, dual approach among the Shia leadership, leadership toward, toward the centralistic policy of President Fuad Shihab and his successor during the late 60s, Shal Hilu, uh, uh, an era or a period of time that known as uh, Shiabism. In the early 1980s, the Shiite public was under dominancy of the Amal movement since it was the only uh, military force of the Shiites in a time of a civil war. Uh, but uh, the seeds for further duality were sown as Hezbollah was established in late 1982. In the next two decades, the differences among the prominent Shiite movements were far beyond daily politics. It was on worldview, on religious versus secular way of life, on the future of the Shiites within the Lebanese state, and on the Lebanese cultural and political orientation. Uh, therefore, we, we witnessed Shiites who were 
uh, in favor of a secular Lebanon, while others uh, preferred an Islamic one. Some were pro-Syrians, others were pro-Iranians, some were activists, other pacifists, and, and this was during the 80s. Uh, okay. uh, I can uh, give a clear example of recent years. Uh, Nabi Berry, who is, uh, as I said, the speaker of the Lebanese parliament and also the leader of the AMA movement, said uh, after the end of the July 2006 war between Israel and Hezbollah that uh, this is a good timing to promote a regional settlement with Israel on the base of the Arab League initiative, uh, which means more or less the 1967 lines, uh, 67 lines for comprehensive uh, peace, uh, while Hassan Nasrallah, uh, Secret Secretary General of Hezbollah, said lately, while revealing the new political platform of his movement, that uh, he said it, it will never recognize the Hebrew state even if the entire world would do so. So let me conclude here and say that in historical perspective, there, are, there were always, or there was always duality uh, among the Shiite leadership on every issue which was uh, on the public agenda. Some were pro-Lebanon entity, others were uh, for a, a wider Syrian entity, some were pro-French mandatory, other were against that, some uh, supported President Shiab, some were against him, uh, some were pro nasserite others were pro-Western, uh, uh, some were pro-Syrian, some pro-Iranian, and so on. So this duality which encourages cooperation between religious sects, uh, partly at least, is an outcome of the sectarian political system and the intra-communal struggles. Um, the electoral system, which I didn't have time to explain, it's uh, 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 this electoral system. Anyway, this system also supports inter-communal cooperation. I'll, I'll just say that um, bec the, the reason for that is that most g candidates uh, um, need actually the support of voters from other religious sect in order to defeat a candidate of their own sect. So this also encourage a kind of cooperation. And my last point here is uh, that sectarian politics prevents, for uh, at least of, for my opinion, uh, my opinion, prevents Lebanon of being split on the base of religious community. Abolishing of sectarianism before having political mechanism that keeps the basic interest of small religious sects might split Lebanon on this uh, sectarian base as we witnessed during the civil war of 1975 to 1990. And therefore, uh, I think the starting point should be changing the formula of distribution of political power within the existing uh, sectarian political system. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we had four presentations which um, described and analyzed different approaches to the question of, or the presence very much so, of sectarianism, taifia or iklimia in two um, important Arab states, Lebanon and Iraq. And uh, we reached a point whereby you may uh, raise your hands and ask questions or make comments. Uh, yes, please. But please raise your voice and be, address your questions to a person, to a speaker. Go ahead, sir. We can see in these days that uh, Saad al-Khariri is going to the one who, who was accused by him as the killer of his father. Isn't it uh, learning from history and trying to see how we prevent it in the end to occur in Iraq too? Thank you. 
please note, take notes and we will answer one at a time. Uh, is that, thank ask, you. Uh, ask again the question. I asked how, uh, how can we uh, uh, make sure that uh, the case of uh, Lebanon won't uh, happen in the end in Iraq, that uh, we choose the elite, and in the end the elite does uh, what it wants and goes to the extremists who gets money and gets uh, the power from the people. Thank you. More questions. Yes, a gentleman in the back. Yes. Take the microphone, Heskin. In fact, I have two questions to Professor Amatia Baram. The first one uh, is that uh, I would like that uh, you explain uh, more about the Sahwa militia which are Sunnis fought against Sun Sunnis, other Sunnis, Ba'athists, and also pro-Al-Qaeda. When uh, they were uh, st started, uh, how they were trained, and who paid their salaries. The second is, uh, is half a question, half comment. During the royalist uh, period in Iraq, all uh, statistical census mentioned that uh, the Sunnis were about uh, 45 percent and the Shi'i 55 percent. And uh, immediately we see that uh, some uh, census today or just uh, appraisal said that 20 percent only Sunnis. Uh, now I want also to, to add in this, during the royalist period, uh, there was uh, lots of attempt of uh, reconciliation between Sunnis and Shi'i, although there was not so uh, uh, hard conflict like today. Uh, I know several families just in central Baghdad, not in the district, uh, that uh, Shi'is were married with Sunnis uh, a lot. And there was a song which I just I mentioned the first uh, uh, first uh, line of it uh, to of reconciliation, a uh, popular, we said uh, like that. Ya Sayyid Simach, Sidli Buniya, walau an inta Sunni wa ani Shi'iya. Hoy fisherman caught for me a fish which is a, a, a kind of Buniya for the for the uh, for the same melody, although. I, uh, although you are Shi'i and I am Sunniya, Bunniya, Sunniya. Thank you. Uh, this is just the first line, but I know all the same. Okay, we, some you can time. tell us about it later, perhaps Thank if you. we have some time. Thank you. More questions? Yes, please, down here. Can you bring, uh, send the microphone down here, please? No, no. no. I, I meant down there, I said Noga. Please pass the microphone back to Noga, please. And we'll get back to you. Go ahead. Thank you, Amno. Uh, I want to ask uh, uh, Dr. Barak and Professor Baram. Um, uh, Oren, I agree with you that um, um, the integrative approach is uh, the best explanation for the conflict in Iraq. And I agree that uh, the uh, structuralist approach is, we, that's the one we should emphasize. But uh, Amatia, if we, um, if we do accept the fact that uh, dismantling the uh, Iraqi army was a main factor here, why shouldn't we look at the uh, Syrian border and the dismantling of the tribal um, a guard, I don't remember, a tribal border guard, and the fact that basically the Syrian border was left open and therefore you saw foreign fighters uh, entering Iraq and when you uh, re-established this guard by the Americans, basically the problem was solved. So there was no tribal element uh, uh, that was uh, the importance of which was so important, but you had a, a, a problem with, with this um, breach in defense. And Oren, um, can you really prove that um, Al-Qaeda was not the main factor in, um, in the conflict? Because you said they entered into Iraq and helped 
um, the uh, fo different forces in Iraq as if they didn't have their own agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Now, will you bring down the microphone? Thank you. Yes, sir. Please address a question, specific question to a speaker. Uh, yes, um, uh, to uh, Professor uh, Amatia, uh, they say that um, sometimes hindsight um, is something that we should uh, really go into, and if we can learn the lessons of the past, maybe we can prevent the lessons of the past and uh, the mistakes of the past in the future. And so uh, the Middle East in, in transition, uh, I had read um, that at the, before the beginning of the American involvement in Iraq, there was a sort of a, an exile government in, in exile uh, that was prepared in the United States, made up of uh, many, many experts in different fields, and the plan uh, was to send them to uh, Iraq, and they would sort of be uh, the, 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 the please government. Please address the question. And uh, so why did this not happen? And then uh, two, uh, is there still an element in the world, American and so forth, that blames the Jews for American involvement in Iraq? And for, uh, and for, uh, for Dr. Oren, in the same realm of trying to um, analyze the past to learn from it, uh, when the French set up um, the, uh, the, the protectorates, uh, they wanted to have a sort of a greater Lebanon and uh, that included the, uh, the sudden um, um, uh, areas which were um, uh, largely Shiites. And was this a factor in the fact that the, the, uh, the Christians could, uh, have not been able to achieve their hope of a, of a sort of a national Christian um, uh, homeland? Thank you, sir. I will ask you actually address two, three questions, that's fine. Um, I think that we let the speakers take up whatever questions they wish or parts thereof, and if we have a few minutes left, we'll take another round of questions. Please, uh, let's start from, as you have tweeted, Amatia, will you please? Okay, the very good question is, how do you prevent in Iraq uh, the repetition of what happened in Lebanon, and in fact, of what happened in Iraq? Uh, in 1920, 21, the British decided to have the King Faisal I, and they actually uh, kicked out uh, the, the Shi leadership because the Shi leadership misbehaved the way they looked at it. They were revolutionary, they were uh, very negative, and the Sunnis were much more ready to cooperate, and they gave power to the Sunnis. Again, the Shiites were there too, uh, to an extent, but basically it was Sunni hegemony. Uh, and it was retained until Saddam Hussein was kicked out of power by, by, by uh, the Americans. And now the Americans gave power to the Shiites, okay? So how do we prevent this from becoming a Shia dictatorship? That's the big question. Because now the Shiite, let's say they are not, let's say they are, maybe they are a small majority, maybe they are 55%, I suppose. Uh, but they, they are a majority. So the, the, theoretically, they can establish now a dictatorship the same way the Sunnis did it before, only much more easily. Or it will be the dictatorship of the majority, because the minority doesn't have a say. How do you prevent that? Well, I don't know how you prevent it. Uh, there is no way of preventing it. The Americans will be out by the end of, uh, of 2011. What I can say, though, this is very interesting, what, uh, what you said, uh, Omri, is crucial to understand also Iraq, about Lebanon, you mentioned Lebanon, in the sense that in Lebanon today, for one leader of a large sectarian group to win against another leader of the same sectarian group, but there are two different groups like Nabi Berry and, uh, and our beloved Nasrallah, uh, maybe Maybe, I don't know if it's happening, but maybe it is. Maybe. Barry will have to turn to some Sunnis and Christians in order to beat Nasrallah. And Nasrallah will hopefully try to turn to, uh, he did already, he has uh, a, a general own with him, and some Sunnis in order, in other words, in Iraq today, the same thing seems to be happening, which is amazing. What will happen after the Americans are completely out, nobody can tell. But right now, the direction so far is promising because for Maliki, 
to beat the Shi'i coalition, the Sadrists, Muqtada the Sadr, and the Hakims, I mentioned them before, and a few others, but they are the basis of this uh, coalition. For him to beat them in the elections, or even more importantly, after the elections, to be able to establish the government, like Bibi managed to beat Tsipi. <laughs> exactly. How did he do that? He was a smaller party, and Maliki would be, I think, a little smaller than uh, the... Did by recruiting the Maronites, of course. Uh, yes, so they will have to recruit somebody. So uh, Bibi recruited the Maronites, thank you, and, and I think uh, Maliki will have to recruit lots of Sunnis and some Kurds. Not many, but some may support him. So, you ha because the Sunnis are very wary of the very pro-Iranian Shi'i bloc, and Maliki appears to be less pro-Iranian, as I said, they're very angry at him now because he slapped them on the face, and that can happen. Will that have some longevity until the whole system works, hopefully? Some Sunnis are so angry at other Sunnis that they'll join the devil just to beat those Sunnis. So what we see today in Iraq is a very interesting development in that respect. I'm sorry, I don't know how to switch yeah, off my... No, this is I don't know how... Oh, no, 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 I'm not. But there is one more thing. One more thing. <laughs> about uh, marriage, about uh, mixed marriages. It happened in Baghdad. Nowhere else, on any meaningful level. And yes, it is true that there was some element of reconciliation under the monarchy. But after the monarchy was, uh, was destroyed, this died out, and under Saddam, he tried, he made huge efforts. He really did, uh, because he was clever. He knew he needed this 55% of the population to, to work with him, and the majority of party members, Ba'ath party members, were not Sunnis, they were Shiites. But my student, Ronan, who, who did his PhD with me, like uh, Noga did, found out something which made a lot of sense. Up to a certain level in the party, the Shiites are a majority. But from a certain level up, the Sunnis are a majority, even though they're only 20%. And I'll just end by saying that the Sunni Arabs, Sunni Arabs are about 20%. Sunni Kurds are about 20 or 18%. Shi'i Arabs are apparently 55%. This is how... Every Sunni that I spoke to said, uh, Dr. Barab, you should know that the Sunnis, we are 50-something percent in Iraq. I said, yes, Arabs and Kurds, but you don't manage very well together, right? And you can see the parties today. You have Sunni Arab and, and the Kurdish uh, Sunnis. They are different parties, of course. And you have about 10% of the Sunnis, about 10% of the Sunnis of Iraq are Faili, Al-Failidia. Al they are Shi'i, yeah. Shi'i Kurds. They are very close to Muqtada Sadr, which is very, namely to the Shia. Okay, thank, thank you, you Amatya. Yeah. Oren? Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, so I, I just, uh, I, have the the um, I have the tendency of uh, thinking in, broad, in broader lines, and uh, Amatya would say you can find it everywhere, but I, see <laughs> I still have some comments here because I try to, to think in broader lines. So uh, from my perspective, uh, to make sure that it doesn't happen in Iraq is first of all, as I, as I tried to explain in, in, my, in my paper, is that I think that the Iraqis at the end of the day, they do not want it. They do not want a system that is sectarian based. And uh, if uh, observers like us would like to have some opinion or, or would like to help them conceptually to, to, to to get out from this conceptual impasse would be to say that uh, that they do not want it, and it can be it can be defined in different lines. It do, it doesn't have to be defined the way it was defined. Mixed marriages, okay? Why did it happen in Baghdad? Because uh, I just mentioned, but that's uh, also part of another thing that I'm trying to to push forward is that the process of national integration in Iraq was an uneven one. It, it didn't happen the, at the same measure in all parts of Iraq. So if you had mixed areas, it was a geographical expression of an uneven process of national integration. And it happened in Baghdad because that was the forefront of this national 
process. And there, people were more liberated from their original uh, community uh, belongings. Now, the question to this gentleman here about the govern government experts and why it did not happen, the government that they have, because I think that, uh, again, we didn't apply at the time, or me, no, but the people that were in charge, didn't apply uh, the same precepts of knowledge that I just mentioned in uh, Mary, uh, Mary Douglas' book, which means that we, do we know how we think? And I think that that was, we were a crossroads of two schools of thoughts, meaning one that thought Iraq as a, as a, as a block, as a, as a integrated nation, and another school of thought that was just emerging that saw Iraq in totally different terms. So I think that the Bush administration just uh, picked one line and then uh, they, got, they got cold feet and they, they picked the other. Um, why, why it happened so well, that's, uh, I was just going to, to hint at, uh, at the title of another article that I want to, to, to write, is that the main problems could be defined in three words. The boots, the vase, and the shoe. For whoever that followed the, the, the process, I think that uh, he, she understands what I mean. Thank you. Thank you very much. But sometimes they don't, and sometimes you see uh, instances of intracommunal violence in the Lebanese uh, political system, and I, I wrote about that, and others did as well. And so you can go both ways. This could also happen uh, in Iraq under these circumstances. Uh, how do you prevent uh, um, extremist elites from? Where's the guy that uh, asked the question? Okay, uh, extremist elites from uh, um, rising to power in these states. Well, actually, the Iraqi case, I think, and the Lebanese case as well, proves that we have we don't have as much leverage on the elites in, in, in states in general. I mean, uh, that uh, the guy that's at power is is probably evil and bad, but you don't know what you get instead of him when you depose him. I mean, uh, Saddam is gone, but we have uh, militias and tribal leaders and Al Qaeda and all these guys. Uh, Arafat is gone, and we have Hamas. Okay. And Busawi uh, is gone, and we have Nasrallah. So I mean, uh, you, 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 there's no way to know uh, when you take somebody out, or if you get another, a better person after him. And I think the, the, the negative. This is the negative uh, side of it. The positive side of it that there are ways to make uh, leaders cooperate, like Gaddafi, for example, cooperate with the international system, and, um, and so forth. Uh, about Al-Qaeda, of course it's an important factor in Iraq, um, but the question is whether it could operate in such a free way uh, if the institutions were still in place, A. B, whether it had such a motivation to, to act, uh, um, because the Americans are basically in Iraq to clear up their own mess. I mean, this is the, the reason that they're staying uh, such a long time there. So this is a uh, continuous cause for uh, Al-Qaeda and, and or the Iraqi Al-Qaeda to fight against. And the support that it receives from the local population in terms of hiding the people, providing them with uh, log logistics, etc. So it's not only the Al-Qaeda and its own agenda, but the circumstances, again, structural, cultural, and instrumental that helps it operate. And the final comment about Greater Lebanon and uh, there is a lesson in Greater Lebanon. There's a good book by Meir Zamir about that. Uh, I have an article coming out that compares Greater Lebanon and Greater Israel as two nationalist projects that somehow expanded and became multi-ethnic states. But this is for a, another lecture, I think. Um, last but not least. Well, I've not been asked uh, anything, so I have no special comment. Okay. Okay? Yeah? Okay.